productive life, in my opinion, answers the why of dairy. If you if you really pull it off with quality animals, it, it, it answers so much. Why are we doing TMR audits? Why are we worried about lameness? Why are we worried about parlors? Well, actually, it's to create and enable these animals to, to last longer. If you really think about it, why bother with uh, wet calves, right? Doing a good job with the calves. Well, guess what? It means we have more of them get to the end in a, in a mature, healthy state, which means they have a better chance of staying. So it, it's just like the universal equation for dairy. Uh, and, and that's why I'm excited. And by the way, also, the way we're heading with this environmental thing, I don't think we have an option anymore. everybody, welcome to this episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. I'm your host for this episode, Gail Carpenter, the State Dairy Extension Specialist with Iowa State University. And I'm joined today by Dr. Gavin Staley. Um, I was really excited for this discussion today. I got a chance to listen to Dr. Staley at a at the Four State Conference a couple years ago and looking forward to hearing him speak again at the Discover Conference here um, in late October. Uh, and, uh, and, and Dr. Staley, I, I pulled up your, um, pulled up your LinkedIn profile and we were ch- chatting about this a little bit before we got started that, uh, that it's, uh, there's, there's some gaps in there. So I want to hear a little bit. You've been, you're with Diamond V now, um, you're a technical service services specialist with Diamond V. Um, you mentioned, I don't know if you want this on the record or not, but you mentioned that your 40th anniversary from graduating vet schools <laughs> coming up here next year, um, but you started with Diamond V. It looked like in in December 2011, or, or 2011 is when you started. So, so what happened in between vet school and where you are now? And uh, tell us about tell us about your journey to get here. So yeah, thank you, Gail, for the opportunity to be on your program. Really looking forward to it. Um, so you can tell from my accent that I'm not from anywhere around here. I'm South African, born and bred, spent the first 40 years there. Graduated back in '84. Uh, spent two years in compulsory military training and then went back to vet school uh, where I was a lecturer for six years in uh, reproduction for my master's degree in theory genealogy and then went to practice six years in my hometown, um, dairy and, and equine. Um, then uh, back in 98, my family and our two young children uh, decided to immigrate to the state. And I was an um, associate at a veterinary practice in Wisconsin uh, for four years. Um, after four Wisconsin winters, for this African guy, I'd had enough. So I was offered a technical service position with Monsanto back then in, in California. So I moved to California and have been there ever since in the Central Valley. And um, it's been a lovely journey. I've been with uh, Diamond V for the last 13 years. Much of what I do is record analysis, a um, lot of on-farm dairy evaluations as well. And um, from those observations have come some of these discussion points that uh, we're going to talk about. When your goal is to help animals reach their full potential, health matters. Diamond V offers a fresh perspective on animal health, a perspective that supports gut health, strengthens immunity, and ultimately enhances performance. For those who choose to invest in keeping healthy animals healthy, feeding Diamond V makes a statement about another dimension of profit, where margins are measured by confidence in your future. To get a fresh perspective, visit diamondv.com, because animal health deserves a healthier approach. So, yeah, let's go ahead and dive into some of this. So, um, one of the things that you really love talking about is the impact of immature heifers. And you have this term, um, Peter Pan heifers. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story of Peter Pan, um, which I fr- found out uh, this past year that some of my colleagues actually aren't familiar with the story of Peter Pan. So had to explain this a couple times. But uh, Peter Pan's problem was that he never grew up. Uh, and so you you coined this term Peter Pan heifers for immature heifers. And tell us a little bit about about the impact of heifers uh, that are that, that calve in immaturely on on the herd. Sure. Um, Gail, so um, I didn't plan on 
discovering it, so to speak. Uh, it, it happened in the dairyman's office, uh, looking at records where suddenly the lights went on and said, we have a problem here. Um, you know, we, we're all familiar with the fact that there was a trend for the last 20 years, actually, to breed heifers earlier. And, um, you know, there's good reasons to do that economically and so forth. But I always joke that there's, you know, there were two emails that went out. The first one said, hey, good, good news, guys. You can breed heifers earlier. There's a second, more important email that we, should have gone out, which said, hey, you've got to do things differently. That one went, that one went to spam. So yep. we, got guys, <laughs> we got guys breeding earlier, and then we, you know, we just saw all these horrible impacts. And it, it, the sad thing is, you know, Gail, is uh, immaturity is forever. Uh, it really, there's no reset button for that. I, I hear a lot of times, and I appreciate your comment there, that, that we got to do things differently. I hear a lot of times from producers like, oh, we're breeding them too early. We got to back it up. Um, and it feels like in some of these conversation, it feels like kind of an either or question, right? You got to breed them at 20 months for 20 months or 25 months, right? And I think there's a lot of nuance missed in the middle of that range um where uh you know like like maybe you know 20 20 21 months probably too young for a lot of farms 25 months is also probably on the old side for a lot of farms and so just because it feels like it's one of those swings we have in industry where oh if old is bad then young must be good but if young is bad then old must be good. I also think what gets missed a lot of times in these discussions, and I'm curious about your um, feedback on this, is it's not just age, it's size. And so if we can raise, and so it's going to vary quite a bit from farm to farm, what your ideal is for your farm. Can you comment on that? Right. No, absolutely. So it all starts actually with the mature body weight of the herd, because there's quite a difference uh, based on the, the genetics selection for years and years. So we, we really need objective MBWs, which is you need to weigh these animals. So there's, you know, lactation 3, 4, 5, 80 to 120 days. What are the weights? And uh, that's your denominator. And then after that, it's, it's objective weights through the heifer program, right? We know that they should be 55 to 58% at conception the virgin heifers so what what often happens is oh they look big enough don't they right no they're not um you really need to dial in on that and then again you know how did they do from breeding through to actual calving you know it's like golf right there's the first nine holes in the back nine you can't drop the ball at the back nine and wind up in in the bushes so it, it it's objectivity and um you, it depends on the farm it's true. Um, it is a combo of um, size and age. Body frame is king. That is really king. And it's really, where's the Goldilocks spot? Where do you hit those that spot where most of these animals are in the zone, where they 55 to 58? And then you, f you figure out w w how many days is that? Is it 420 days? Is it 405 for my herd under my circumstances? And then I say, go by age. If your system's delivering the product at that time, you got your minimal viable product at that time, then you must keep it simple. Go by age. I agree with that. I think that gets missed a lot. And I think especially that conversation around mature body weight is so important. And it's very key for a lot of things, not just heifer development, but also it's kind of the basis for a lot of the um, assumptions that are made in like the CNCPS model. And when it talks, when you're talking about heifer growth requirements and, and, all these other, there's a lot of assumptions that are built on it. And we really have this tendency to be like, man, we think mature body weight is X. And we never question that. And that's something that really gets under my skin a lot is that, is that, is this thing that is so critical for us really understanding how we should be feeding and managing our herds is just kind of something that we make an assumption on. Would you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, Gail. I mean, you, uh, when, when this all started, you know, this sort of epiphany for me happened in January 2016 in the dairyman's office. And uh, I looked at a lot of records, and that's part of what we might talk about. But I bought a scale, and I started weighing animals and colleagues of mine. We weighed thousands of animals, and it was really comical um, how far out we were. And this, this is even experienced dairyman saying, I think that is a 1,500 
No, it's not. It could be 1650. In other words, we've got 150 pounds out. Do you know how much time that represents? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a major deal. So I, I personally think every dairy should have a scale to be weighing heifers and cows and so forth. A lot of thumb suck. Yeah. So I, there's some really, I saw a, a, a presentation that Mike Van Amberg did a while back and he talks about some of the trainings that they did and they had veterinarians and nutritionists and producers um, like eyeball it and everybody was, nobody was good at it. <laughs> and everybody always thinks that they're the, that they're the exception, right? That they're the one who has it like, man, eh, you know, some, a lot of people aren't good at it, but I'm pretty good at eyeballing this. <laughs> right. 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 You know, I, I facetiously say, you know, um, everybody knows what we should be breeding at. So it's like, Oh yeah. The F is 52 inches, you know, um, 800 and, 60 pounds or something, you know, so they know that, but I'll tell you what 52 inches and 860 pounds is she's in the breeding pen and she's in heat. Mm, yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. I appreciate your, your comments that every dairy should have a scale. I was actually, we were talking about some of your work actually at some of our extension events this past winter. And one of the producers at one of our meetings made a comment that, oh, you know, we had a scale, like when we got a robot, um, we had a scale included and it, it broke a couple years ago, but we never used it. So we never got around to fixing it. And <laughs> <laughs> there's a disconnect, I think, a lot of times when we know that it's very valuable information, but, but if a producer never sees it used, then they're not going to understand the importance of it. And, you, you know, Gail, you don't have to weigh every animal. Mm -hmm every month it, it's really what i say is you do it a couple of times intensively maybe twice a year to know what your system's delivering and then back to this time thing you know age of breeding or now you know what your mature body weight is you know you don't have to do that every six months you know i'll just put a shameless plug in that if you're a dairy producer in the state of iowa um extension will help you with that process so um <laughs> That's, You'll be busy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, are there, so, so the scale is obviously our gold standard, right? Uh, but, you know, if a dairy producer doesn't have a scale available, we have weigh tapes. Um, a lot of times people might use a drive over scale. What are, what are some, what are your recommendations on collecting body weights if the gold standard isn't something that's accessible to you right now? So tapes are fine. And, and, you know, large parts of the Midwest and East and Canada are smaller dairies. Uh, and, you know, you're not going to buy a scale for that. So I think tapes are fine. Um, but, you know, west of the Mississippi on our dairies, it's justified for sure. When you're collecting, doing that, you said twice a year, pretty intensive. How, man, how many cows are you doing? What age groups are you targeting? What are some of the best practices that you have for collecting that data? So, you know, the focus is often on the young calves, right? So we know what birth masses are, we know what weaning weights are, and then we kind of lose them. Uh, and I almost say that those early weights are the least important because they're, they're still important, but I would rather have the breeding weight because you only have one shot to change that animal's trajectory, and that's when you breed her. After that, it's running like an engine. It's nine months, and she's in the system, and that's it, you know. So I say a month before your expected breeding of heifers, that's a very good time to do a cohort. How many, you know, as many as you can, quite frankly, at least probably 10%. But what I say is weigh a bunch, get the average, and then see what the next one's coming in are, are doing when that's stabilizing and you're saying, you know, you know, the next five are also in that zone, we're probably close. So there's that, then, you know, you can do springers, Gail, um, and then calculate two extra pounds per day, depending on 278 days carrying calf or whatever it is to get as close to that. Uh, and that's usually 93% of mature body weight. Immediately after calving the first two or three days, it's 85%. So you need one of those two to know how your back, back nine holes are doing. And twice a year is usually a pretty good benchmark, you think, for, for most yeah, folks? Yeah. Not, and the reason I say that, there's, there's, a summer, there's a seasonality to this, absolutely. You know, the calves born in winter perform differently to the calves born in summer. And as they grow through the system, obviously, they show up in the breeding pens. 
So you want to be doing animals that have a summer history and animals that have a winter history. They're different. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting point. One of the things that you talk about a lot too is, um, and I guess maybe it's the next step after this, right? So we talk about immature heifers, these Peter Pan heifers that kind of start off on maybe the wrong foot. Um, but uh, but another thing that you like uh, that you discuss a lot is the impact of these young herds or why productive life matters. Um, so can you can you expound on that a little bit? Sure. So just back to the Peter Pan heifers, the term I like to to um, focus on is we should be creating platinum heifers. You know, just like the airline. So instead of Peter Pan heifers, platinum heifers, elite heifers, top genetics, grown out well, reaching their their goals at the right time. They come in at the right weight. They calve well. They transition well. They peak well. That's what we after. Because basically, the mature herds, what I call the golden girl herds, or the or the Christmas tree herds, which we'll talk about, they stand on the shoulders of platinum heifers. If you do a poor job with immature heifers, that herd is doomed. It's going to be mediocre. Absolutely, will be mediocre. And so, you know, you know, what is an elite herd? And this was another discussion that started about four years ago. If, if you travel the world, you, you invariably get asked, wherever you are, China or Israel or Germany, they'll say, um, how do you get to 45 kgs, 100 pounds? There's this idea that that's, that's the gold standard. Um, and so I was looking at, at this, uh, addressing this question I was asked by a colleague. And I looked, I've got about 400 herds in my backups. And so I went through, what are the top herds doing? And Gail, there were two things that stood out. The one was they calved in high producing heifers. And the second part was they, they had the ability to create and retain older cows. And that struck me because, you know, I wasn't looking for this, but Create and retain all the cows, that's productive life. So that, that created this whole idea of, okay, what are the benefits of that? And, um, you know, once you've got a, a, a herd that's, uh, you know, got golden girls, golden girls are, are lactation five and six that are, um, you know, you need about 13 to 15%. Once you have those animals at the top of your tree, so to speak, that allows you to have fewer uh, replacements coming in it allows you to have a lower culling rate and it allows you to have lower heifer inventory. But you need them before the other good things happen. And it doesn't go backwards. You can't just lower your cull rate and, and think somehow you're going to have um, these, these elite cows accumulating at the top. They don't. You're going to have a bunch of frail care, old broken cows. One of the things we talk about or I talk about a lot with our producers is the invisible cow, the cow that, you know, she calves, you calve her, you breed her and you don't see her. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The four event cow, right? Yes. Invisible cow. Yes. Yeah. That's what we want really, you know, and top dairymen have the ability to do exactly that. They have the ability to create and retain these cows. We're not talking, they all eventually leave, right? And we're not, somehow giving them all this this pass, this green card to stay. No, they're still under rigorous culling conditions. But we want to allow them to get up through the parodies to accumulate at the top before they leave. That's what we're trying to do. And there are many of these animals that are for, for event or dang close to invisible that produce, you know, 200,000 pounds of and they're just there, you know, and we just want more of them, right? They shouldn't leave because they're old cows. So what's your what's your feedback on a common, um, common pushback on this concept would be, well, your younger animals are going to bring in your genetic advancement, right? They're going to, in theory, if you're using AI and you're using top bulls, the, the younger animals are going to have a genetic advantage over your older animals. So what's your response to that, to that critique? So if you look at the lactation curves, lactation groups, right? There's a significant difference between ones and twos and threes. My, my comment to that, and I'm, I'm very much for genetics, but here, here's the point. If we're chasing genetics with a lot, without allowing those animals to actually express their phenotype, their genotype in the phenotype, I, I say it's like sending your kid to, a, you know, a top private college, you know, depending where I am, it's Stanford or it's Cornell. Um, it's like sending your kid to a really prestigious university 
but they never graduate. That's kind of what it is. You have these beautiful, I just say you're eating expensive genetic hamburgers and you're just spinning the wheels chasing this elusive genetic future. It never arrives. It just never, ever arrives because the vast majority of two-year-olds will never, ever compete with a two or three. If you just look at the curves on average, they are way behind. They need time to pay for themselves too, right? Yeah, that's a very important piece of it. You know, um, break evens second lactation, probably in the first third, depending on feed and milk prices. And so you look at the, you know, all these two-year-olds basically should have, in my opinion, an ear tag that says mortgage. They haven't paid themselves off. And so just common sense would say, why would I want more of these animals? You know, we, we love marginality. You know, the whole story back to John Fetro's days, right? Marginality, the value of marginal milk, marginal piglets, whatever. Well, productive life is marginal lifespan or parity. We're diluting out all that maintenance of growing these animals, you know, and there's this idea, oh, well, you know, heifer costs are fixed cost. You know, that's a fixed cost. Like, it's not important. I say, you know, there's no loan forgiveness plan for heifers. Somebody is paying, and guess what? It's the dairy, and it's maybe the third highest cost, right? You have to cut those costs. Oh, do what you can. You know, why have a whole bunch of them, these high inventories? Yeah, especially today. Look at the cost of raising a heifer. Mm-hmm. Well, the cost of anything. <laughs> With input costs going up, heifer costs are definitely, definitely greater than they used to be. Um, which might, I guess, on the flip side, to play devil's advocate for here for a little bit, is that an argument for 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 breeding heifers to calve in younger? Because then you're reducing cost of heifer growth. Yeah, you know, I think that's one of those um, tripping over dollars to pick up pennies deal. Oh, it saves me whatever forty dollars to do this earlier. Maturity always wins. And and the problem is this, is that it doesn't stop at, at, at one. You know, you can, here's how it works, basically. Um, you can um, break even more or less. The cost to feed that heifer or the, the, the opportunity not to feed her, to breed her earlier, is offset by the milk that she didn't produce, lactation one. But you've got to look at lactation two because that pattern persists. And, and I looked at a lot of herds, um, 147, 400,000 cows. There's a 92% correlation, Gail, between 10-week milk of lactation one and average annual milk of the whole herd, which is phenomenal. It's pretty powerful. And it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, so if you just think, if I up at one pound, that's one pound every cow every day, the whole herd. So it just goes up the tree. And, and gives these knock-on benefits again and again and again. It's very short, very short-sighted to suggest that you're going to somehow offset that by breeding earlier. It doesn't work like that. I guess maybe for the folks who are listening, um, since this is a podcast, so it's an audio medium, not a visual medium. Um, I know what you're talking about when you say these these Christmas tree herds. Can you can you maybe describe that in a little bit more detail for the folks who are listening who are like, why the heck are we milking Christmas trees? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So um, every dairy basically can be represented by some form of a pyramid, right? Some, some triangle. And um, the youngest herds look more like what I call a Chinese hat. You know, those flat, flat bamboo hats. They, they very wide at the base. And that would be some like 50% L1s, 30% L2s. You only got like 20% lactation group three. Very flat, high color rate, high replacement rate turnover rate, you know, that's the Chinese hat. On the other extreme, you have, well, the ultimate extreme is the, is the um, pasture-based herds, where it looks like one of those fir trees, rocket firs, you know, where they got seven, eight, nines. But the, in the confined dairy systems we deal with, it's more like a Christmas tree. It's a little broader. Starts off at about 30%, 30 to 35 at the L1s, and then it gets obviously less and less as we go up. Uh, allowing you to get to somewhere around 13 to 15 percent, five and six. So that's the Christmas tree that I talk about. We must break down lactation group three into lactations, or you lose the effect. There's there's three parodies that are hidden in lactation group three, and you know one of the problems, Gail, that goes on, especially when you've got a lot of heifers. I call it uh, you know heifer pressure. It's like a hydraulic pump that pushes from underneath, pushes these poor old girls out, you know, um, 
it, it makes that tree look like it was struck by lightning. You, you know, the top's just gone. And, and if you think about it, if you take the top off, those animals will, there will be other parodies that pick up the numbers. So you'll go from, a, if you cut the top off of a Christmas tree, the next year it flops back. It actually goes to the left. It goes back to a Chinese hat. And the sad thing is to build a Christmas tree, if you've got a Chinese hat, it's going to take you three years. So let's say you've got a good cull price like we had, right? I think it's changing, but we have a good cull price. Oh, I'll sell this, salvage this old cow. I'll get this amount of money that offsets the heifer cost. I don't think those two should be related at all. There's nothing about the cull price that impacts the cost of raising a heifer. Nothing. Those two should be separate. But and yet in the mind of many dairymen, it's like, oh, I'm offsetting it, you know. So they sacrifice their tree for a short-term cash flow from a, a salvage cow, not thinking, hang on, what have I just done to my tree? Because who knows what the salvage price will be in three years' time, three months' time. The tree is forever. I guess that's a that's an interesting question because it is um it is really a natural tendency for a lot of dairy producers to want to hoard heifers, right? Like it's a it's kind of almost a uh, risk attitude thing that you want to keep, like, let's keep these heifers around. So I have a buffer and you never know what's going to happen. And, um, especially with, you know, repros improving in a lot of herds, um, we have sex semen. It's really, it's a lot easier now to get heifers and probably more than enough heifers. Um, so how do you have that conversation with a herd about that, that idea of heifer pressure and, and if, of herds experiencing some of that heifer pressure, how do they, what are, if you have an abundance of heifers, what are your steps that, that you should be taking to, to use that inventory? Well, you're absolutely right, Gail. You know, the mindset back when we had 20% preg rates and horrendous calf mortalities, a heifer was like incredibly valuable, right? So the mindset was you keep them, you keep all of them. And then the playing fields changed. Sex semen came in, 30 preg rates, and suddenly burgeoning heifers. Uh, and so, and also the banks, the banks like to have heifers and the, the equity models. So that's, that's also another piece of the equation. Um, but then we had this beef cross, right? Unbelievable. The, the prices that fit $550, $600 day one, you know, no risk. So that changed the story. So we still had this very efficient repro engine, but instead of producing a whole bunch of heifers, it now shifted across to beef cross. And I think it's went too far. I actually think it's gone too far in many cases. Um, in that now we have dairies that have got low heifer inventories, but they don't have the wherewithal to create and retain old cows. Now they now they got a real problem. They're going to have geriatric frail cares at the top. Um, bad 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 situation. You can calculate how many you need too, Gail. I mean, there's there's equations to know, you know, non-completion rates, um, age at first calvings, and so forth. You could there's there's equations to how, how many do I actually need at this culling rate? It's not a mystery. I think we have a tendency a lot of times, and we talked about this a little bit too when it comes to um, breeding age. But I think we have a tendency a lot of times to look at these benchmarks and see them as KPIs, right? Like my call rate should be X um, <laughs> and my heifer inventory should be this. When it really is a system, right? Like like having the heifers to fit the call rate that you have, that you can support based on, it's all intertwined, right? And I think a lot of times in these discussions, we really focus on, oh, our call rate's too high, our call rate's too low, our heifer, heifer age at first calving isn't what it needs to be. And and really what we need to say is, is what is the system, right, that we're dealing with with this whole farm? Right, right. You, you've got to earn these KPIs. It's very, very dangerous to just go after a KPI. Quality has to perfuse right from the bottom, from day one, colostrum, right? Quality and, and um, intervention, management intervention has to basically earn the rights to some of these superior numbers. Um, and sadly, it takes time. It's effort. There's a benefit uh, bother ratio in this thing. You know, you have to put in some bother to get the benefit. And I mean, I've heard dairymen say it's just too much trouble. I don't have the labor. I've got, you know, old cows are trouble. I'm just getting rid of them, you know. And then they stay in this semi Chinese hat mode forever. And it's not, it's not profitable. And we're not even talking about, 
you know, methane, the G, you know, GHGs and water issues and environmental issues and social license to operate issues, which are all very much under pressure in the Chinese hat model. Very hard to defend a 50% cull rate to the average soccer mom. Yeah. One other thing, just to ref you were talking about the excess heifers. I've heard dairymen say, well, I'm keeping them in case I have some kind of a problem, right? The black swan event, right? What if I have an outbreak of fill in the blanks? Um, but if you really think through black swan event, uh, Gail, a black swan event happens at a moment in time. You have two years of heifers with buffer. Like, that's an insurance policy that's costing you lots of money, millions of dollars, actually, uh, if you'll add it up over time, for, the, for, the, for the, the fear that you might have an event that takes out 50 cows. You'd be better off <laughs> to just pay for that event and have a lean, a lean time for, what, five, six years in between the black swans. <laughs> And besides, you can't wait for these heifers to catch up. You have a black swan event here. Well, that doesn't help you if you've got a heifer that's six months, nine months younger. You can't wait. To, you have a problem anyway. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. The what What is it actually doing for your risk management? Yeah, not much. Let's talk about, um, you know, we can talk about benchmarks and KPIs and call rates and percent of L1s and all this. And so you spend a lot of time looking at records. I, it's one of my favorite things to do also. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. Um, fellow nerd here, I guess. Um, so you spend a lot of time looking at, looking at the records for these herds and, and the, the dairy count backups and, and all that. What are some of the things when you're looking at a herd what are you looking, what are your first things where, where these are, you know, red flag, green flag, I, I may have a problem or this herd's doing a great job. Of course, this is a, this would take more time than we have, but I, I start <laughs> off, I, I, um, I look at the parodies. Um, I look at the percentages of the different parodies. They're M305, not ME305. ME305 is very deceitful. Because uh, that includes, so that, that includes age at first calving as an assumption. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's it's fictitious. It's a mathematical uh, outcome. It's, and, and yet I've heard there, oh, well, look at my, you know, my lactation ones, they're 31,000 pounds. You're not paid on an ME305. Right. <laughs> and the M305 between L1s and L lactation group three is about five to 6,000 pounds, actual mill, you know. So, um, I look at that. So, I draw the tree. I'm, I'm known to carry a whiteboard around with me to dairies and I stick up my whiteboard and we dry erase, we draw the tree. We draw the actual dairyman's numbers, milk production, and that gets the idea through very quickly. And then you can look at the cull rate because here's the other pit. Your L1 percentage will be your cull rate if your herd is not expanding or declining, right? It makes sense because your replacement rate equals your L1 and your replacement rate should be your cull rate. So then you know what your cull rate um, is or justified. And then from there, you can also then see how many heifers you need. You know, we shouldn't be one to one, 50%, you know, of all ruminants. We should be, you know, if you're down at 30%, 32% cull rate, that's 65% heifers. Um, so th that's where I look at, okay, what's the heifer inventory? Um, what's the tree? I look at the average annual milk and the projected milk. By 10-week milk, see how close they are. At 38%, they're virtually on top of each other. They're very close. I look at the graphs of age at freshening for lactation 1 and 2 and the production. Always look at that. And always look at lactation 2, not just 1. So that gives me an idea of the um, platinum heifers, if you like. What are they doing? So if the heifers are coming in at 95 pounds at 10 weeks, uh, 98, we and then the lead herd situation, right? I expect the energy corrected milk to be over 100. So how do you have, when you're having these conversations with producers, how do you have that conversation about, uh, you know, what your numbers are, are versus KPIs? So another example, we talk about call rate. Another example might be like, oh, I have a target. I don't want more than X number of cows to leave before 30 days of milk. And I think sometimes when we start talking about those numbers, the the instinct is to say, oh, then I'm going to call my cows at 31 days of milk, right? Or like we were talking about with the call rate. Um, yeah, I've, I've, <laughs> I've seen to, exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the focus, and I love 
I think the dairy industry is very unique in that we have so much data available to us. Um, and, and so I, I think we're unique also in being able to make decisions based on KPIs and benchmarks more so than maybe some of our other, um, animal agriculture industries, but, but sometimes, sometimes we put the cart before the horse. So how do you, how do you have that conversation with a producer about that? So I've got a bit of an allergy to KPIs, to be honest, um, because I've seen some of the the negatives, you know, that come from that. I tend to focus on the dairy itself. It's an ecosystem in itself. So I'm, I want to compare it to what it was, where it's going. So, for example, when you look at culling, there, there's a quota of culls, right? So let's say it's 35%. I go and look at, so how's that broken up? You know, is it 50% repro and low production? That's kind of what you want, right? You don't want the broken animals. You want volitional culls. Uh, And then there's, I call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, Those are the main reasons why animals don't become golden girls, the four horses of the apocalypse. It's transition, it's mastitis, it's lameness and injuries, and then it's repro. Repro is improved, but, you know, in hot environments, that's still an issue. Um, It's still a horseman of note. Transition is becoming more and more important because as your age hurts, it's harder to transition them, right? All the subclinical diseases, subclinical hypercalcemia, ketosis, endometritis, you name it, old, older cows have issues with that. So I go into the records and look at each of those horsemen for that dairy. And each dairy has one or more horsemen. That's significant. And then we talk about how do you fix that horseman? The four horsemen are all about prevention. Once they show up, it's too late. So then you're looking at the, what I call days in milk delta. You know, what are the swings in days in milk? Because that's so, so critical. Dairies that are elite have very limited swings, maybe only five days up, five days down. Why is that important? Because when you've got these big swings, it usually means you've got a major heat stress issue. And I, I, when you have a big swing of days in milk, that means you've got a big swings in calvings. And when you have a big swing in calvings and you have a stable milking number, that means there's huge pressure at that moment on old cows. And and that's what I call it mass extinction events for old cows. In come the heifers, out go the cows. So the more we can dull this thing down, the more chance these cows have got of staying in the system. I like that. It's a pretty unique way of looking at that. That's a, an easy to remember too, the four horsemen. Yeah, we've spent a lot of time, I think, on this podcast talking about the prevention versus treatment. And um, I think that kind of comes back to some of what you and I have been discussing even today with the, um, what is the system, right? And I think a lot of times we have a tendency to be very reactive to whatever's right in front of us where, in, where it's the system as a whole that we need to be focusing on. Yeah, we're very quick. And that's why I'm not so keen on KPIs, you know, like, oh, I've got a 32 preg rate. So what? <laughs> you know, let's see how many pregnancies you're generating and when you're generating them. And what's your D- and what's your DNB, by the way? You know, so there's, there's so much of it. Always one's looking at how do you help this dairyman move to elite status or as high as he can go, because some dairies never get, they're not all A students. Most every dairy, unless they're terminal, should be thinking, hoping to stay around and to become more productive, economically efficient, sustainable, right? So you spend a lot of time looking at these records. Um, and everybody knows that that records come with strengths and weaknesses, right? Not everybody's doing everything the same. Not everybody's recording everything. And so what's one of your, what's something that you wish every dairy would do when it comes to record keeping? Fresh cow events, mm. <laughs> transitions, you know, <laughs> Because there'll be a difference, you know, it's protocols or, you know, the metritis is called dirty or, you know, it's, it's sort of you have to sometimes really look at when you absorb the file, see what they're calling these, these events. Because, and, and there's still this sort of uh, – sometimes I look at records and say, I don't believe this. <laughs> it's not that good or it's not that bad, you know. And so if it was accurate, it would be really quite helpful. The other thing is CARs you know, reasons to cull, that is so misleading, right? You, you know, girl, you've got a, a cow that has twins, right? Then she has an RP, then she has a DA, then she gets lameness. And then finally, we cull her for mastitis. Is that really the story of that cow, right? And so the CARs, they are what they are, but you really got to dig in and say, what is breaking cows? 
what are these horsemen actually doing to my herd and, and when? One of the things I, uh, I love doing uh, and I always encourage my students to do is um, looking through remarks. And sometimes it's just entertaining. The, the, <laughs> the uh, creativity that people have when they put remarks in for, for a cow, um, especially if she's leaving the herd for a bad attitude, um, <laughs> right, right. can be pretty, uh, pretty entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You actually sometimes have to go through the remarks because you learn more from them than you do from the CAR sometimes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> the other thing, Gail, is, is when they leave. So you mentioned the first 60 days and you know back to Sandra Garden and students so you know the 25% first 60 days. And that's that's important, but I'd like to look at the whole spread of culling over the over the, the days in milk. Ideally what we should be doing right is having a nice big group late. When you get a, a bunch of animals leaving at 60, 80, 100, you got to ask yourself why why, why didn't they have the resources to stay, body condition school, whatever, right? We want, we want heavy, old, older, well, not older, but in the lactation, heavier, later lactation animals, because that's your highest value cull. They are going to leave and they're a source of income, but, you know, so I love to look at that whole spread and it's amazing what you'll see. Well, we've been talking for, for a bit now. Um, can we, uh, is there anything we miss? Anything else we need to be, you need to get off your chest before we kind of start looking to wrapping this up? You know, uh, Gail, I never thought, I, I, I never thought I'd even say this, but as I've looked at productive life and the implications and where the dairy is, the dairy industry is around the world, right? It's not just the Netherlands who've got this issue with environmental challenge. It's coming everywhere. It's coming to our, it's coming to a house near you. Um, productive life, in my opinion, answers the why of dairy. If you if you really pull it off with quality animals, it, it, it answers so much. Why are we doing TMR audits? Why are we worried about lameness? Why are we worried about parlors? Well, actually, it's to create and enable these animals to, to last longer. If you really think about it, uh, why bother with uh, wet calves? right? Doing a good job with the calves. Well, guess what? It means we have more of them get to the end in a, in a mature, healthy state, which means they have a better chance of staying. So it, it's just like the universal equation for dairy. Uh, and, and that's why I'm excited. And by the way, also the way we're heading with this environmental thing, I don't think we have an option anymore. Yeah, 50% cull rates, rates aren't going to cut it any way you look at it. You know, I, I, a lot of times when we're talking about sustainability, uh, environmental impacts, I say, you know, the, the most, so as a car, for example, um, one of the most, uh, sustainable choices you can make is something that's, that's older, um, because you don't have to have the footprint of, of creating that vehicle. And of course, like that's, that's very nuanced, right? There, there's, um, there's a lot that goes into that calculation. That's maybe a broad generalization, but um, probably the most sustainable vehicles that were ever driven are my dad uh, fixes up old Geo Metros, um, <laughs> gets 60 miles the gallon and, and doesn't make any new, any new, uh, any new footprint from production of those vehicles. So, and I think about that a lot of times when we're talking about um, this idea of heifers and, in you know, buying secondhand basically and, 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 one of the ways we can reduce our footprint is by not creating more animals than we actually need. That's a wonderful analogy. Can I use it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the old, I always say that the, the cheapest car you have is the one in your garage right now. It's not always true, but you know, there's a, there is a, it's a lovely idea. You know, you just obviously keep these going for longer and longer and, you know, insurance and all these things go down. It's, it's a very good analogy. Love it. It's time for our famous three. Maximize profitability and herd health with early detection in animal health, reproduction, calving, and feeding. The most advanced bolus technology and professional support from agricultural experts makes this possible. Smax Tech, the health system that future proofs your operation. All right. Well, if we have if we have no other points to hit, um, we can go ahead and move into our three questions that we ask all of our guests. Are you uh, Are you ready? Ready? Yes. Fire away. Uh, our first one uh, would be, what is your favorite dairy-related book or resource? JDS. 
JDS. Good answer. Journal of Dairy Science. Yep. Yeah, I, I try and read every every article, and it, there's always something that you, you can. I, I'm somewhat biased, but I'm always looking for things that can fit into the productive life story. And you'd be amazed how many things there are, right? So yeah, JDS. So what would be your favorite non-dairy related book or resource? Well, one that was pretty impactful recently uh, was a book called Outlive by Peter Atia. He's an MD. And it, what he's basically saying is medicine is, uh, is reactive human medicine. That's what he calls 2.0. You know, you have high blood cholesterol, we'll give you the statin. And he says, no, we should prevent this. And he talks about the concept of health span, not lifespan. This is very fascinating. It's your last 10 years. You're trying to live at a higher quality because ultimately everybody drops. But his whole point was lifespan is very it doesn't tell you enough, right? It's like culling reason, C-A-R. It's health span. How good are you in that last 10 years? And I resonated with that because that's cows. That's productive life. How do we get the top of the tree? So Peter Atia Outlive, it's good for all of us because it's about our own quality of life. I'm going to have to think about that a little bit more. I've never thought about applying some of those things to, to how we uh, our day-to-day lives and health. That's really interesting. Yeah. He calls it medicine 3.0. It's preventative intervention okay. before, right? All right. Very cool. I like that. All right. Our last question that we ask everybody is uh, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are not successful? I'd say relevance. If you can't bring something that's valuable to the dairyman, you don't have a story. You need to be up to date with what's going on credible, and then ultimately relevant to the situation. It also say, be useful. All right. Uh, Dr. Staley, is there anywhere, if people want to find more about what you're working on or stay up to date on, on what's going on with your work, is there anywhere they can go? Yeah, there are, there are quite a few YouTubes out there. Um, we have resources here at Diamond V um, that can be accessed. Um, an email to myself would work um, as well. I can access them um and there's some you know publications in the lay press as well platinum heifers peter pan heifers golden girls yeah right although if they google golden girls they might find something different than than something yeah. about your work so right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably have to put staley in there with them yeah there you go <laughs> All right. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. This was a really good discussion. Uh, I'm not sure when this podcast is going to drop. Um, and uh, I'm not sure when people are going to listen to it. So it might uh, it might go up in the next couple of weeks, but people won't listen to it for a while. Um, but if you're listening to this in the fall of 2023, just know that there is a Discover Conference with ADSA uh, that's going to be going on in October. I don't remember the dates off the top of my head, but I think it's the third week of October. Is that yeah, about right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, yeah. in uh, Chicago. Yeah, yeah, Chicago. Discover conferences are always good. Um, always really enjoyable. I get a lot out of them. And uh, Dr. Staley is going to be there talking about this and having a little bit of a debate about some of these issues with uh, with uh, some alternative viewpoints. So it should be some really interesting, really interesting should be good. discussion. Mm-hmm. Should be good. All right. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you, Gail. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.